My name is Don Thibault, and I'm the organizer of this content, uh, content track. I'm with the OpenID Foundation, and I'm pleased to um, present Dr. Torsten Loderstadt, who will um, uh, take you through what uh, the technical thinking behind what Andre Durant called uh, earlier in his keynote one of the most important uh, things that is shaping the identity ecosystem. And that, in some ways, it could be referred to as kind of the collision of open banking and open identity. So um, I think Torsten will be able to give you a deep dive into how those architectures are thought of now and how they look as they will evolve over, um, over the years in both uh, Europe and the rest of the globe. Torsten. Don, we have more four, four minutes to go, right? Oh, I can, I can, I yeah, can yeah, say yeah. more good things about yeah, it. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, four I have four minutes Ask to Ask people tell you to about become Torsten. members of the Open ID. <laughs> <laughs> um, what I can do is to say that uh, the Open ID Foundation is the standards development organization that has been developing the financial API standard over the last uh, several years. Um, we've also been able to develop with that standard a self-certification test suite so that we now have the first set of organizations, banks, challenger banks, et cetera, that are um, taking the self-certification conformance test to the financial grade API standard. So I think that the the fact that we have a standard and a self-certification test is an important takeaway for understanding what we believe um, will be a common denominator across the globe, both in the UK, in Europe, Australia, and here in the States. And that is to say that this security profile called the financial grade API will be that common denominator for deployments of open banking and hopefully PSD2. So I hopefully hope that gives you some context. I hope that you um, interrupt Torsten and uh, ask him challenging technical questions because he really does have, I think, a, a holistic look at this intersection of the requirements of PSD2 and this global phenomenon that we're calling open banking. And now I will introduce Dr. Lutterstadt. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for your warm words. Um, what is PSD2 all about? So first of all, it stands for Payment Service Directive 2. This is a directive um, issued by the European Union that obliges any financial institution in the European Union to provide access for third parties, trusted third parties, to um, account information and to allow those trusted third parties to initiate payments. And moreover, it also obliges any financial institution to perform what's called strong customer authentication for any access, online access to payment accounts. Uh, strong customer authentication more or less means a combination of two-factor authentication, which is tightly bound to the context of a certain transaction. And the two different um, factors needs to be exchanged via independent channels. So one might, uh, might say, well, that's rather straightforward. Let's define a set of APIs for account information, for payment initiation, uh, use OAuth for authorization, be done. Right? Those were, those were my thoughts initially when I heard about PSD2. But it's a bit more complex because of the, of the rules that are, are defined uh, by PSD2 uh, and the requirements, the security level that is required and the authorization mechanisms that are required to really comply with the directive cannot be fulfilled with, I would say, traditional OAuth, right? And that's, that's the reason why we are seeing extensions, customizations, proprietary solutions uh, in this field. And there's another reason for that. And that's the sheer complexity of this whole activity. So I would like to, get, to give you some insight. A 
PSD2 is a directive. It passed the European Commission and the European Council and the European Parliament. And it must be implemented by all 28 member states of the European Union. Which means they need to implement that in their local law, either by creating uh, a new law or uh, change existing one. And most of them also define their own technical standards. So we have roughly 10 different technical standards right now. It's 10 because some of them converged and use now uh, the same technical standards, but there are a lot of them. And what is even more a complexity driver is the sheer number of financial institutions in the European Union. Does anyone here in the audience know how many financial institutions exist or operate in the European Union? Any guess? We've got four, five, 26, Chris, you are an expert. So it's, it's 6,000 financial institutions. And they need to implement PSD2 within 18 months. This creates a really chaotic activity under high pressure. And that explains a lot of things that, that happened within the PSD2 uh, universe. So in two and a half months from now, uh, this is going to be reality. So banks have to expose those APIs uh, across the European Union, and we will see how this is going to work. As an OpenID Foundation, we provided support of some, of, to some of those uh, um, activities, namely UK Open Banking, Berlin, Berlin Group, and NextGen PSD2 and STAT. And that's what my presentation is based on. So the, the experiences we gathered why we are working with those initiatives. And um, what really excites me about that is that different groups within the short time frame had to develop a sounding solution, which gives us and which gives me the, the opportunity to compare those solutions they developed and what we could learn from that for the future, for example, of OAuth. So let me, let me uh, dive into the, the technical details. So first of all, what are the commonalities between those different um, APIs? Yeah, I mean, that's not a surprise. They, they offer account access or account information for debit and credit accounts. And all of them support the um, credit transfer schemes that are being defined in the uh, common European payments area. And from a technical perspective, no surprise at all. It's based on HTTPS and JSON. And all of those initiatives somehow support OAuth. The differences, well, there are regional, regional speci specialties. I mean, I'm not a payment expert, but I learned a bit in the, in the course of this activity. So there are different settlement systems. So UK has a, has a local payment, a settlement system. The Poland, Poland has a, a local payment system. So there are the differences from a fu fu uh, uh, functional perspective. And from a technical perspective, we also see APIs that utilize XML. We have all sorts of message signing. And um, we still need to see that this message signing mechanisms can be used in a robust and reliable way. Because HTTP signing is an art itself. And uh, there are differences in the, the way payments are initiated. And the topic I'm going to focus on right now is the API access authorization part, because that's, that's, that's my main topic. That's why I consider myself to be an expert. Uh, and it's called SCA modes. So how is API authorization performed in the PSD2 space? So there are different so-called SCA modes. I'm going to start with the less common but very interesting modes. One is called the embedded mode. Embedded mode means that the the client, which is called TPP, has the full control over the user interface. That's what product managers really like. But it also means that it has a downside, because this TPP is going to handle all the credentials. The first factor, the second factor. It's all going through this TPP, which somehow contradicts the development in our industry. right? And um, it trains people to use or to enter their credentials any place, because a customer cannot really distinguish whether the, the, the application it, acts, uh, it uses 
is a certified PSD2 provider or not. But this approach is regulatory compliant because the philosophy of PSD2 is as long as all the participants or attendees in the system are regulated, everything is fine. Um, in the morning, we have heard that FIDA2 is the future of authentication, right? And I really like that. But the problem is this, this mechanism doesn't work with FIDO because it contradicts the trust model, the basic trust model of um, FIDO2 web often. This model is supported by next-gen PSD2 only, and my assumption is it will be implemented in Germany only because of very special reasons. And there's another mode. It's called decoupled. Um, in this mode, the um, TPP also controls the user experience, and the whole uh, strong customer authentication process is, is conducted via a second channel that's... Um, that uses the bank app uh, between the user and the, and, and the bank. Um, as a technical uh, uh, detail, this kind of flow does not really support SSO because every TPP directly interacts with the ASPSP, which also means there, no, there is no shared context on the client side, which also means it has security implications because the, the service provider doesn't have a, any knowledge about what's going on on the consuming device it is possible to, use, to utilize this kind of flow for kind of session fixation attacks because someone can just type in your public ID and cause a, for example, payment, uh, the authorization of a payment initiation transaction. So it's very important to really uh, clearly indicate to the user what's going on in order to prevent the user to just click confirm and the transaction goes through. Um, what I think is, this mode is very beneficial for all the scenarios where uh, a user interacts with a device, uh, with a foreign device, such as in a point-of-sale scenario. This mode is supported by next-gen PSD2. Um, it's also planned to in incorporate that in the UK open banking. And the Polish API also has uh, support for authentication in an out-of-band fashion. And now we come to what we all would have expected, which is a some kind of redirect-based uh, authorization. And I call it redirect mode and not OAuth or OpenID Connect mode because there is no pure OAuth or OpenID Connect in that space. On the right-hand side, you see a, a, a description uh, how the different initiatives that support this kind of, of, of mode uh, are using it. NextGen PSD2 has a completely proprietary redirect-based model and an OAuth mode. So you can pick and choose if you want. UK Open Banking uh, is used on OpenID Connect. Actually, UK Open Banking implements the FAPI read-write profile. Then there is the French initiative, which is called STAT, and they use a completely proprietary protocol. And um, there is an initiative in Czech. Czech uses a OAuth mode plus a proprietary mode for the payment initiation. The Slovakians, use OAuth for basic functionality like AIS and PIS and OpenID Connect-based interactions for authorizing the payment initiation. And Poland uses a highly customized OAuth load. As an observation, what we have learned is all those homegrown solutions and all customizations, or most of them, had security issues really basic security issues. I'm talking about CSRF attacks, open redirection, injection attacks, and so on. Nothing really special, right? And um, for example, we, we helped STAT uh, to, to, to fix one of those vulnerabilities. Um, but the question is, why do those initiatives come up with those weird solutions? And the answer is, it's about the special authorization requirements. Let's stick into that. PSD2 requires a ASPSP or the TPP to gather consent by the user for a certain transaction on a very detailed level. So the user has to, ac uh, has to confirm that access happens to a certain account, what actions the TPP is allowed to, to execute on that account. Might it be just access to the balance or the account history or something like that? 
And for the payment initiation, it also requires that the token, for example, that's being issued is really bound to the pay and the amount of the transaction. So you can't solve that with just a, just give me access to your account scopes. That's much too trivial. So this is an example how the data that needs to be sent into the authorization request looks like. So you've got an amount, it's a currency, you've got a debtor account, credit account, and so on. So clearly you can't really convey that into the authorization process using a simple scope. Let's take a look under that, how those different initiatives solve this problem. Let's start with NextGen PSD2. In NextGen PSD2, they take this data and create a RESTful resource. And they then use the identifier of that RESTful resource and send it in the authorization request using what we designated as dynamic or parameterized scopes. It's hell of a word. <laughs> Especially in German. <laughs> no. In Deutsch is total einfach. <laughs> okay. UK, UK, and then the authorization server uses that ID, looks up that resource, obtains all the data, and renders the user consent. And that's also is a, a difficulty that, that, that implementers were facing. The kind of user consent that's required in PSD2 is much more dynamic and much more detailed than what's typically, what you typically can find in an OAuth deployment. Um, UK Open Banking used a similar pattern, also using a resource, but the way the information about the, the, the specific resource are conveyed in the authorization process is a bit different. They use a consent ID claim within the claims parameter in a signed request, right? Um, so both are calls by reference, if you like. Um, the Polish initiative went a, a bit different way in that they included all this additional um, information directly in the OAuth authorization request, but they don't send that authorization request via a redirect. What you typically do, they send the authorization request to the back end of the authorization server. So that's not really OAuth, right? They send that request to the authorization server in order to protect its integrity, which makes a lot of sense. And then, and this reminds me on uh, Justin's talk on Tuesday, the authorization server issues a URL for the redirect. That's interesting, right? So the same idea is popping up, popping up all, all, over the, uh, all over the place. So there's much more to talk about or to, to report about that. If you want to know more, I have done a blog post on Medium. Uh, you can find uh, the URL on the, on the bottom of this page. So, um, We as a community and as a working group have been working very hard to support PSD2 while it was being implemented. And we also try to, to deduce um, what we can do to improve OAuth and OpenID Connect in order to come in the end, come up with interoperable solutions. Because it's, it's clear and it's apparent for you based on what I have told you, there is no interoperability across the European Union, Union when it comes to PSD2, just because of those different uh, initiatives that are incompatible. So on our end, we, try, we are trying to come up with uh, specifications that, that will help to facilitate a development where there is a convergence between those different uh, initiatives. I just listed some of those documents that might be relevant uh, for you as well, because this is not only about open banking. This is about... Um, using OAuth and OpenID Connect for doing security-sensitive stuff, right? So there is, first of all, there is a new security best practice for OAuth that was highly inspired by PSD2, a recommended read for anyone, anyone deploying or developing OAuth-based solutions. And then there is the mutual TLS uh, for OAuth spec, which is a cornerstone of, of this initiative because it allows to authenticate um, clients' TPPs using public key certificates, which is a key element of, of PSD2, and it also allows to send the constraint access tokens, meaning those access tokens can't be replayed on the resource server. Very, from my personal opinion, at yes.com, very easy to use, very easy to deploy, very effective. 
And then there's the FAPI profile. John, Don already uh, uh, mentioned that. That's the profile, the high security profile that we are developing at the FAPI working group, including conformance tests, which is very in, uh, important for interoperability. And since we are, we want to get better, we are evolving this, this profile, and that's why we have specified more modules that can help you and people working in the open banking community to fulfill the requirements that, that I just talked about. First of all, there is a, a mechanism called JARM that allows to um, sign and also encrypt authorization responses. And there is SIBA, the client-initiated pack channel authentication profile, which is a mechanism that allows to conduct a decoupled authorization process using standard OpenID Connect OAuth technology. And recently, we published a new draft that allows a client to send the request object or deposit the request object with the AS, which allows uh, the transmission of rich authorization data to the AS before the actual authorization request uh, will be started. And yesterday, we, we gathered uh, and sat together and talked about how we could support on a standard-based way what we call, or what I would like to call, rich authorization requests. So all those data that I have shown you, how can they, can they be carried, conveyed in the authorization process in a standard-based manner? And uh, yeah, expect a, a draft around that topic to pop up in the upcoming three months or something like that. And with that, I would like to open the floor for questions. So all these challenges on the security, um, existing security models uh, are coming due to the consent management? You mean the challenges I, I, I just mentioned, or? Exactly. Not only. I mean, basically, um, there are requirements, for example, to sign messages and so on, which are not directly related to consent management. But for me, the authorization aspect is a very important aspect. Why all those different standards deviated that, that tremendously from, from the identity standards that we are familiar with. So how is the banking industry in North can, can you speak up this? How in the banking industry in Northern America is dealing with these kind of challenges versus European Union banking challenges? I don't know. We've got a representative of the uh, FDX, so do you? <laughs> Okay, so thank you for the question. So come to the next session and <laughs> we'll learn <laughs> how this is going to work in the US. We, the next session is much more uh, broader in terms of policy and deployment issues. Yeah, I have a question about structured scopes. I mean, mm -hmm. scopes are like one of the most controversial pieces and highly, like, widely interpreted notions of OS2, right? How do, uh, do structured scopes help to address the ambiguity? and provide a little more a clarity around them? First of all, scope. The scope parameter is largely underdefined in RFC 6749. For good reasons. Because we were unable to come to a consensus. Okay. Um, I think you can expect uh, a more, more clarity in the upcoming draft. Um, more guidance, how to use it. And I would like to invite you to give feedback on the draft. We're going to publish that in the context of the OAuth working group at the IETF, which is a very open, very open uh, group. So just, just post to the mailing list. So I would really appreciate your feedback as well. What's the timing? Um, my plan is to, to publish something in summer, depending on my and Brian's availability. Brian Campbell sitting here. <laughs> Thorsten was um, politic when he said, we haven't come to consensus yet. <laughs> but uh, in Washington, we have an expression that there are two things that you don't want to watch being made. One is sausage, and the other is legislation. <laughs> the third I that I would add is standards development. <laughs> Any other questions for Torsten? 
what are common open source uh, technologies that institutions are looking at and employing as uh, core components to uh, specifically for you know these authorization processes that you know support OAuth? Most organizations I work with um, are looking for either commercial products or open source uh, in the in the space of OpenID and OAuth implementations. I mean, they, they, they will, need, uh, will use more libraries, but they are not directly uh, tied to, to the specific aspect, right? And there are, for example, also open source PSD2 implementations available, which gives you kind of a framework, an API framework where you could just come plug in your core banking system. So there's a whole new space of open source projects in, in, in that area. Uh, is there like a directory or something of that? No, it's more along the lines of having a, a standard conform API layer that provides you with interoperability according to a certain standard. And then you have uh, the, the ability to plug in your core banking system. That's, that's what this is all about. Uh, I, I don't think directories play an important role in that context, but I'm not quite sure. We've got a question in the first row. One question that all the models Can you wait for the microphone? So all the models what you describe, which have the redirecting to the server, so is that the authentication and authorization servers are separated, or, or they're showing as a representative perspective as a one block or one component? Uh, you're referring to the block that uh, has this ASPSP term? Yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, there are different ways to solve that. From my perspective, from a logical perspective, from an architectural perspective, it's the same. So the ASPSP, the financial institution, conducting the authentication and gathering the consent. Clearly, they may rely on an external authentication service or something that, uh, like that, which makes the process a bit more complicated because if financial institutions outsource this kind of stuff, uh, it's highly regulated and they have to make sure that any external entity also complies with the regulation. So my assumption is most of them will implement that in one piece. Questions, comments, snide remarks? In that case, um, another round of applause for Torsten's <laughs>